a distinction between uh, uh, written and oral methodologies is different, is, is important, is relevant uh, with regard to the representation of voices, uh, voices from the past. We have voices from the past that are sometimes written down and that are sometimes distinctions between living for the uh, new generation. Uh, written so and oral methodologies how is different, is, is important, is relevant uh, with regard to the representation of voices. Uh, voices from the past. We have voices from the past that are sometimes written down and that are sometimes distinctions between living for the uh, new generation. How is different, is, is important, is relevant uh, with regard to the representation of voices, uh, voices from the past story. We have voices from the past written sources uh, that, we, that we use, the written sources from the past that we use to tell our histories now. Firstly, these were people who could write and read. And secondly, these were people who could write in a specific language, in an elite language or a colonial language that was spoken by many people in a large area, so that they would have a good readership. So therefore, you see that actually there are very few written sources in a language like Zulu in South Africa, or Mangalai in Flores, or Dawang in Timor. And there are many more written sources in, for instance, Japanese or Sanskrit or some of the European powers that came here to uh, note down what they observed, uh, like Dutch, Portuguese, English, French. So what happens in our histories to the people who did not speak Dutch or French or English or Sanskrit? Uh, or what happens to the people who did not write at all? Um, so, so, with regard to numbers, uh, in Indonesia, when Indonesia gained independence from the Netherlands, I have been told about 5% of people could read and write, 1 in 20. Now, in the Netherlands, this might have been a bit more, but still, in the 20th century in the Netherlands, there were many, many people who could not read and write at all. So, how are they represented in the sources that we use from that time? Of course, they, they are written about by people who could write these languages. So there is a power issue there that I think is important to think about further. Uh, and also maybe to think about on a more theoretical level, uh, because if we, if we build our knowledge, shape our knowledge, of course, text is very important. Um, um, it, 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 as I said, it gives a kind of stability. We can document, record certain experiences, certain observations that are actually fleeting, that we have in the moment, but when we write it down, we fixate it. And we can revisit the experience, we can revisit the observation, we can dissect the observation, we can analyze it, we can interpret it, and then we hope to understand it. That's the basis of all science. And it's very effective. It's a very effective way of, of orientating yourself in the world, of knowing. But it's not the only way to do that. And that is something that I realized uh, very much when I researched South African Moscana music. And I'm certainly not the first one who realized this. There's lot, there are lots of books being written about this, of course. That people who participate in Moscana music, in an oral culture, they they make sense of the world through the music, we all do. Also when we are very literate scholars, we understand the world in certain ways by the music we make, by the music we appreciate, by the dress codes that belong to that music. So music is a way for us to make sense of our worlds because it also helps us to manipulate experiences of time and space. Music can bring you to another place in your head. Music can bring you to another time in your head. It's connected to certain memories that can really transport you kilometers away or decades away. 
Um, so it's a very powerful tool to, to do that, to orientate yourself. And I want to sort of go into that a little bit further by giving a, a short example. So if I have this, this thing here, we call it pen. In Holland we call it pen, I think in Indonesia you also call it pen. And in, in English it's also called pen. So it's this three letters, P, E, N. And these letters, we have agreed with each other that they refer to this thing, this object here. So there is a very direct relationship between the sound of the word pen and the letters P, A, N on one hand and this object on the other hand. It's a, it's a referential uh, relation between the sound and the object. So I think a hubunga kini, very direct point. So if I sing a tone, la, what is this tone about? It doesn't refer to anything, right? You cannot say la, this tone refers to that or that or that. And then when I sing la 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 I think we all recognize it, we know what this is. There is a reference to uh, this, this song, this libel. But still, I would argue we don't know what it means, because the referential reference is not enough. If I would play this song from YouTube, it might mean something else to you, at least to me, than when I'm singing this with my Oan Blanda body, right? I'm singing it here with my Oan Blanda body, it might make a different impact on you than when I would just play the song from the internet. Uh, for you, the song might uh, have a different meaning anyway than it has for me, even though I also learned it in kindergarten, like you hear in Luxembourg when I was about four years old. Um, but for instance, someone who, a, a, an Indonesian person who fought against the Dutch oppression up to the 1940s, might have a different understanding of these, these, this tune than an Indonesian person who was a former political prisoner of the Suharto or the Pahlo regime, right? So it's the same song, it's the very same song, it's the very same tune, but the meaning is not only a reference to a specific thing. There is much more going on, which is very, very complex. Uh, which makes me think that, that music is also a way of understanding in a non-textual, non-referential way. Um, so, I, and I would say it's also an embodied, embodied way. How do you say that? Jasmani? Uh, jasmani? Uh, woman Jasmani, rather than a, than a, than a woman Petunjuk. Um, and of course there's a combination, because in language too, there's also aspects of embodied knowledge in the way you say certain words. And, um, so, so let's not make false distinctions here, but, but, but I think it's a very important aspect of sound, also the sound of language, uh, that makes sound a very important way of knowing. So another thing about sonic understanding, sonic meaning, is uh, that it's fleeting. So now I've finished singing this tune, and if you're all in a conspiracy against me, you would say, oh no, she didn't sing the Indonesian national anthem, she sang the Dutch national anthem. And nobody can check it, because it's gone. Not entirely, of course, because since um, 1877, we can capture sound. And of course, this lecture here is also captured and being put on YouTube, so it's being recorded, it's being fixed, like text can also fix. Tan we can, we can fix the sound since 1877. We can play it back, we can listen it back, we can then again dissect it and analyze it and interpret it and maybe understand it in a certain way. But of course these, these machines that you see here, the, the gramophone, or the phonograph, the great phonograph, they are also very expensive and rare instruments in the late 19th century. So they were again, it was an elite and uh, uh, 
colonial agents who could use this machine to decide what they would record, what they would dunk up, and what they would not record, what they thought was not worthy of preservation. Uh, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that the gramophone also led to a huge democratization in the, in the experience of sound, especially in the 1920s when electronic sound technology became available and you could manipulate sound electronically, amplify it. So it became much cheaper to use and huge numbers of, of bands and people could listen for music from anywhere in the world. So musicians from West Africa, as you say, it's top right, they could, they could hear how, pe how people would make music in Cuba, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, uh, musicians in Batavia and Jakarta could hear how music was made in the Middle East, in Hawaii. I mean, Kwachon would be inconceivable without the technology of recording and, and, and moving sound. So this is one part of it, and the other part of it is that the gramophone was also used in ethnomusicological research. Um, so, so many people went around the world and thought this is a way to actually capture sounds that might vanish because they're not played anymore, because they get extinct. Again, there are power issues here, because who could record the sounds? Who decided which sound were worthy of, of preservation, the and the static And what were the circumstances of recording? Was, were, were these spontaneous expressions that were recorded, or very carefully staged uh, performances? And what you see is often that what we have recorded is is basically also something that that uh, responds to the aesthetic needs of the recordist, who was often from Europe or from the ruling elite of a country. So the kasuka anesthetis of the of the Barakan Barat often became very important in what these recordings were and what we have left uh, from the past. Um, how long are we doing this time? We still have time. Oh, yeah, there's the yeah. Um, so then, of course, there was radio also. Um, and that also often served colonial state policies, which imposed certain boundaries between who colonized and who was colonized, and who was supposed to listen to which music, or to which speech, or to which language. That was all carefully policed and, and uh, there was a policy behind that. Um, often also, here you see the princess of the Surakarta court, who's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who, is, who is giving a speech for the solo radio vereniging, SMV, uh, I think also in the 1920s. Uh, um, and, um, Often these broadcasts were recorded also. So they were not just sent out in the radio, but they were, they were recorded with recording technologies. And this, of course, was not only music, uh, but also speech. Um, the experiences of people, uh, emotions. You could hear the emotions in people's voice, something that is not so easy to transfer in a written text. How does somebody feel when they say, uh, I've just walked down that street and I saw this accident happen. Um, when, you, when you hear someone's voice, you get a lot of information that is not in a written text, or not always in a written text. So the experiences and emotions of ordinary people, but also special people, like this princess here, uh, were recorded in that time. But also, for instance, soundscapes. So, um, we, we very well know how a big city in Asia or anywhere in the world, how it, how it looked, what it looked like. Because we have pictures, we have silent film, we see all the little cars going through the streets in silent film. Um, so we know what it looks like, a city. But what did it sound like? What did Bangkok or Singapore or 
Jakarta sound like in the 1950s, 1950s. Um, often we don't know. Our histories are very silent, uh, I think. And the Nazi Sitiara Masidiam. And there is research also being done in Indonesia to change this. I know of research of uh, a couple of architects in Bandung who have tried to reconstruct the soundscape of, uh, of Batavia and Jakarta over the decades by looking at pictures of what kind of sound sources there were, like trees with animals, but also Kaki Lima with, with, uh, with people selling stuff, or trams, or um, cars. And then with those, this information, they've reconstructed the soundscape of a certain town in a certain time. So, so the Chakapan, uh, Panalaman, Parasaan, Wangbiasa, they and also the Suara Lingoman, they can be they can be found on sound sources and and also reconstructed. So, with these recordings also of colonial radio, um, much of that because it was done by people who often came from Europe or were from the ruling elite. Much of what was recorded ended up in Europe, in archives in Europe, in museums in Europe, but also behind the wall of Kratons here, uh, in national museums here that had the legacies of, of uh, the Dutch uh, archives as well. And generally, it's quite difficult to access that material uh, for those, for instance, who want to hear what kind of music their ancestors played, or yeah, what the spoken experiences were of, of ordinary people from the past. And with DECOCES, our project Decolonizing Southeast Asian Sound Archives, we want to change that. As you see, it's a project, three, three countries, we got funding from the Dutch government, the French government, and the British government to open up three seminal sound collections and um, open them up not only to researchers uh, in universities or in research institutes, but also to artists who might want to do something with the sounds, or activists who want to empower their own community and show other people what the traditions of their community were. Uh, NGOs, uh, curators, here in Southeast Asia. So this is a societal goal of the project, that, that we make it available. Um, sorry, I need to go to the That we make it available for all kinds of people. But there's also an academic goal to the, to the project. And that is that we might be able to reconsider certain historical narratives through the use of sound sources. Uh, because the sound sources might contain information that we cannot find in the written sources. The kind of information I just outlined, like what kind of emotions people have, who actually, which people are actually heard, whose voices are heard. Um, so this is an academic goal. So what we want to do um, is open up three different collections. Uh, the first collection, as, as you see at the bottom left, is a collection by ethnomusicologist Dana Rapopo, a French uh, colleague of mine, who did really wonderful research in Panathoraja in the 1990s and early 2000s, um, recording 40 hours of ancient ritual of the Toraja people, uh, which is allegedly Austronesian origin, so before Malay and European influences uh, came. And she recorded this in the 1990s and published it on DVD. But as we all know, you cannot play DVDs anymore. Your computers don't accept the DVD anymore. So now it's unavailable again because nobody can play DVD anymore. So she's migrating that material from the DVD to an online environment, which is very complex because it's interactive with all kinds of interactive features. So that's one part of the project. 
The second part of the project is that we open up the BBC Empire radio collection in Great Britain. Uh, so this is the radio broadcasts that were recorded from British Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, Burma, um, in the late colonial era, so 1930s, 1940s, up to the 1950s. And you see a sort of treasure of information there. For instance, broadcasts of uh, Cantonese opera being performed in Singapore, but also speech uh, responses to the speech by Wong Carlo on 17 August 1945, how ordinary people reacted to this. Um, and also testimonies of people who returned from working on the Burma Railway after the Japanese occupation and what they had actually experienced at the Burma Railway. Again, we know quite much, quite a lot about what the making of the Burma's Burma Railway looked like, but how did the making of the Burma Railway sound? We don't know, actually. Um, and the third uh, collection that we open up, I will tell a little bit more about this because I'm the curator of that collection. That is the Jan Kunst collection at the University of Amsterdam. Um, Jan Kunst, he was uh, a very field worker in the early 20th century um, who spent time in what was then the Dutch East Indies between 1919 and 1934. Um, and he recorded a wealth of music from the whole archipelago. Um, but on his terms, so it's also very problematic material because he carefully staged, he had to because the material need, uh, required him to stage very carefully what, what should be recorded and how. Um, uh, and he's actually one of my predecessors at the UVA because later he lectured at the UVA. Um, so the collection uh, I put here is spread over various locations. So each color represents a different location. So you see that as Pakma Mona Suda Suda Bidao, um, much of the sound recordings are in Berlin. We have copies in Amsterdam. Uh, there's silent film and a legacy of letters from his granddaughter that we have in the musicology department, basically in my office. Uh, there's photographs, dias, lots of correspondence because he kept all this correspondence that was outgoing and ingoing. Uh, in the, the library of the university, which is part of the Allard Pearson Museum, and that also contains field reports and publication manuscripts. And then, of course, he also uh, assembled a lot of musical instruments, which he didn't bring with him to the Netherlands because he thought he would come back to Indonesia. Uh, and these are now at the National Museum in Jakarta. So there are four, actually four locations over which the collection is spread. And as you see, not only is the collection spread over different locations, also there are many sources of information carriers. So there's sound records, there's silent film, moving image, there's still image, the photographs and the dias. There's lots of textual information, as in the list, in the reports, in the correspondence, in the publication manuscripts. So I give a little bit of an impression about that here. We see from many different parts, uh, uh, Kunst assembled his music, and took pictures. So here, this is Timor, dances from Timor, Dori Dori playing from Mias, Sassando from Flores. Um, so there are lots of different locations. Here you see some of the correspondence with scholars. Uh, family, but also uh, colleagues in Java uh, that he worked with, and his correspondence with the local nobility as well, with whom he was very well connected. Um, then you see maybe some of the faces you recognize here. <laughs> uh, 
that uh, we have most of the written material in the Allard Pearson Museum. Uh, this picture was taken at the left by Jit Arenda, who's also here somewhere. Um, and then here, this is the material that's in my office with, uh, with lots of photos, but also, as you see here, music transcriptions. So what, 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 what is this material actually? It is material that is a, is a representation of, of what Kunst heard. It's Kunst's attempt to put, to capture what he heard in different formats. Um, and you see all those different different formats and and um, ways of um, ways of documentation. And here, this is in the National Museum in Jakarta with some of the musical instruments and Ibu Rufi, who was then on the research department uh, and also being very involved in in the activities. So. Um, the goal of this project that we got funding for, DECOSIS, it is to bring all these different materials back in dialogue with each other because they're spread out. And you can have a, have a movie about something, I can show you. Uh, we will listen to a little bit of sound in a minute. But then the sound is also represented in a certain way. And how, you know, I see myself more as a, as a researcher of kunst than as a researcher of the music that we researched. Because I want to know what this working method was, because still we use these kind of working methods that were devised in a certain period of time for certain goals. Um, so, so maybe I can give this as a short example, the sound from Nias. Uh, uh, I will play it outside the slide. So you will hear uh, is it, uh, Dolly Dolly, Dolly playing uh, from Nias, uh, recorded by Kunz in April 1930. Uh, and I will show you first. Let, 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 let's listen first. Maybe you can jump down for yourself in your head or on a piece of paper what, what occurs to you when you hear this. Um, because because the, 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 this is really what the sound is. Uh, so you might, might think it's not the sound system, it's really the kind of, of, uh, of source that we have left. So, so this, um, I'll go back to the presentation now. Let's talk about that. has been transcribed by Jacques in music notation, as you see here in his publication, Music for Nias. And then, uh, here you see, at top right, you see the picture of people playing that very instrument. And you also see pictures that he took of specific dances. And we think together with Pachitra uh, and Moscus, we think that these are more dances uh, uh, from Nias. Um, and then here you see in the film. Uh, let's see it again. Still have to do that outside the presentation. Okay. 
And here you see the moving image of those same dancers. So what I think is quite interesting that you see that, that these sounds are all transferred into something visual. Whether it's text, whether it's photograph, whether it's film, it's all made visual. Because then we can actually do things with it that, that make us understand it. That's really how our knowledge uh, acquisition and, and shaping works. That's also what we're trained in university to do, right? Um, so so this, this might be something to discuss later. Um, and of course, these, all these sources, the film, the photograph, the sound, they contain different forms of information about the past. Of course, they contain musical information, but they also concern geographical information, architectural information about the houses that you see, social and political information, because you see certain people doing things in certain places, there have already been cultural diplomats coming to me and saying, okay, I can use these images as proof that once these people lived here, and that therefore they have a certain right to, to be there now. So there are much, there are much more implications of this material than musical, musical uh, research only. Um, yes, so, um, the next question is how are we actually going to do this? Um, make this material accessible to those who might have an interest in this. That's not so easy. <laughs> um, so what we first do is that we build an online platform. Uh, it's called Southeast Asia Hearing and we want to put all the collections that I mentioned there and make them searchable with, within one system. So it's a big database that we are currently forming. It's a huge task, but, but, but it's, it's very important. And we have lots of discussions about how to shape this database, because we are used to certain forms of categorization, right? To, to use certain names for certain genres, and certain styles, and certain eth ethnic uh, origins, and then, of course, always people also start to ask questions about these labels. Fortunately, do we still use those labels or do we use other labels? And then what kind of labels do we use? Because we also need standardization in order to make it searchable. So that's, that's very difficult. Um, uh, and we do this, therefore we need, we really want to centralize our partners in Southeast Asia. Because they actually should decide about what happens with all this material. And here I listed uh, some of these partners, most of them actually. Um, so you, you see here the UP Center for Ethnomusicology in, in the Philippines, um, the Institute for Research Governance and Social Change in Kupang, uh, my archives of Sunway University in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, the Associatie Traditie Lisbon in Jakarta, the Traditional Arts and Technology and Ethnology Center in Laos, and of course the Chitra Research Center by Chitra Ayanari, who's also here, um, uh, have specific projects also about repatriation. Um, so, what kind of roles do we do we um, uh, do, can can these partners take in our projects? Um, of course, they advise us and, and each other about ways of storing and categorizing uh, the material and ways in which we can share this material and repatriate it, maybe, um, by indicating the needs of, of maybe museums and small archives and uh, researchers and artists here in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Laos. Um, and what we also see is that we uh, can do a, a, a 
the exchange of practices of, of archive curation. That, that certain things are done here in the Philippines already that we have not thought about in Europe. I will give an example later. Um, of course, there are many archives also here in, in Malaysia, in, in the Philippines, the Jose Maceda archive. Here is the Nogalanta, of course, there's, there's a Museum Nationale, there are lots of archives here that might be connected to our platform and that might also be searchable. Yeah. What we also think about is to establish mirror collections so that there become certain app, uh, access points here in Southeast Asia where researchers don't have to go to Europe to access the material but can access it, it here or nearby. Um, and what is very important uh, to have our partners for is that, that we can together build a network of people who need this archive material or, or take some interest in it. Um, uh, and these are not only scholars, again. We can, these can also be artists or representatives of local communities who want to know about their ancestors. Uh, so we want to build an inter-Asian network of, of expertise on the sound heritage curation. Um, so, I skip this for now because we can use it in the discussion. And these are the two final slides. Um, we also have three other initiatives next, next to this um, online platform that we built. There are three other commitments that we made for this project. Um, first, we organize a lot of outreach projects. Uh, uh, we think about festivals, about seminars, but also really artistic ways of using this material. Also, uh, to expose younger generations to it. The Chitra Research Center is busy with that to, to make sure that younger generations are exposed to the, to the material that is, uh, that is archived. We strive towards joint publications because many of the partners from Southeast Asia report to me that sometimes it's difficult to access established publication channels for all kinds of reasons that we can also discuss later. Um, and, and what we want to do is actually have joint publications in which our Southeast Asian partners decide what are the important issues if it comes to archive curation. Um, because you often see the kind of North American, European tendency to say, okay, I'm going to have a, um, uh, a combined volume, a, sh a shared volume of articles, and then I also invite some scholars from Indonesia and the Philippines, and then we have all a nice diversified uh, volume of articles, but then again it's this, this, this researcher from Europe or, or America deciding who's going to participate. And we want to turn it around, that, that, that actually, maybe we get invited as Dutch people, but maybe not, that's also fun. <laughs> um, and our, uh, what is listed here as the uh, uh, first project in red is a very important project that I want to bring to the fore here, because we also have budget for visiting fellows. Um, and we can sort of welcome about six fellows uh, and fund them for about three months in Amsterdam or Paris or London. Uh, and these six fellows come from the entire Southeast Asia. Uh, and they can use that time to spend time in archives that are under operation that I just mentioned, but also more archives. So we have connections with Bild en Geluid in Hilversum in, in the Netherlands, but also Von der Kammergief in Berlin, Von der Kammergief in Vienna. Um, and what we're looking for is actually early, early career scholars. So people who, uh, who, have, who are not yet established. And not only scholars, but also maybe artists, again, or activists, or cultural diplomats, or uh, community members. We have no other funds to go to Europe than our fund. So we really search for people who have no other opportunity to make the journey to Europe and take this time off for three months and, and, and research. And we can help with the setup of an application. We can help organize what, what 
could be researched. It's an open call, so our call for application will be out soon. It's an open call with an external ju uh, jury. But prior to the application, you can always contact us to uh, see whether we can help with a specific research question or a specific focus of research that you need the material that is now in Europe. And of course, this research should concern sound records and some degree, but can also uh, be part of the written archive of such collections. So I want to make sure that everyone knows that this opportunity is there and maybe you can look out for the, for the call. Um, so what we ask in return from such a fellow is that, that uh, he or she presents her research to peers in Amsterdam and join activities, our activities of joint publication. Uh, but what we, what we would also like to ask is to, what would really help us if, if people could make an inventory of um, access hurdles. So there might be problems with finding the material because certain names are used. Uh, there might be a lack of support from the staff. Uh, there might be any other burden that, that I might not see because I don't have a problem with it. So, so that's what we ask. We actually want to make an inventory of hurdles of access of archives in Europe so that we can make recommendations to other archives in Europe by saying, look, have you looked at, you know, uh, this form of categorization? or this way in which the staff could help a researcher from Southeast Asia to find his or her way much better. Um, so that's what we do the fellowship for, to give something to the fellow, but also to, to, to help the fellow advise us about what could be done, how the, how the access could be improved in, in European archives. And that's really the mission of this project, that we want to improve the access to archive, that we want to transfer the agency of who decides about the material to agents in Southeast Asia, and that we want to diversify the discourse. So who, who talks with us about how you should curate this material? Uh, many people in Europe have all kinds of ideas about this, but how do we do that? So what, what, according to us, decolonization is not a topic or a thing because it's very much a buzzword, especially in Europe. Everyone is jumping on it now. Oh, we have to decolonize, we have to decolonize. Uh, but it's much more a practice. It's, it's a method. It's, it's, a, it's an attitude of, 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 uh, of, of, of listening also. I think the metaphor of listening is quite useful in this respect. Um, and, and that's also something that I would really love to discuss with you in a minute. That, 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 that sometimes what we think that could be from Europe, from a European perspective, would be good, then we need to say why, you know. <laughs> so this, this, this dialogue we need. For instance, uh, one, one example before I stop uh, uh, is the working method of the, of the University of the Philippines Center for Ethnomusicology. They no longer go into the field to record. They train people from communities to use uh, recording equipment to record themselves what they think is important to record. So it's no longer the ethnomusicologist or the scholar who decides, oh, this is interesting music, this is something that I want to keep. It's the member of the community themselves who say, okay, this is, this is something I might want to keep or, or, and this not. And for me, as a Dutch, Ethnomusicologist, this was an eye opener. I thought, oh yeah, of course. Why could you not give that agency to the community themselves? So the UP Center for Ethnomusicology was much more advanced in, in thinking about these issues than I was. Um, so I think in Europe we can learn from such such initiatives. Um, yeah. And I think that, that apparently that is not only a question for Europe and for European scholars, but also for institutions here. So that, that may be a way of starting uh, the discussion. I've been talking too long, uh, like always. Apologies, Mark. Thank you very much, Barbara. I think I'll just give a little bit of a recap. So, Barbara bersama dengan seorang kolega di, uh, di Amsterdam.
sedang sana sedang membuat satu project dengan judul uh, Decolonizing South Archive in Southeast Asia. Nah, project ini ingin mencoba untuk um, menempatkan terutama tiga koleksi arsip suara penting yang ada di uh, di Eropa, yaitu di uh, Jerman, di Inggris, dan di, di, uh, di Belanda. Arsip-arsip suara mengenai Asia Tenggara dari berbagai aspek. Ada yang berupa musik, ada yang berupa pidato, ada yang berupa pengalaman, apa saja uh, dari berbagai uh, bekas siaran radio dan sebagainya. Nah, uh, aspek itu akan dijadikan satu uh, uh, dalam pengertian aksesnya. Jadi outcome dari proyek ini ingin membuat akses untuk bisa uh, menggunakan arsip itu atau menggunakan arsip-arsip itu sebagai bahan untuk melakukan research. research ataupun bahan untuk apa saja misalnya komunitas yang ingin mengetahui tentang uh, etnik budaya etniknya atau seorang diplomat budaya yang ingin um, membuat program diplomasi budaya seorang musikolog yang ingin mengembangkan uh, serisnya mengenai musikologi atau uh, apa saja jadi karena asin itu uh, banyak sekali variasinya uh, di yang yang ada di sana. Jadi itu yang akan dibuat menjadi lebih mudah untuk diakses oleh para siapapun yang ingin menggunakan. Nah, karena suara memiliki uh, atau ikatan yang sangat kuat dengan ruang, dengan waktu, dengan individu, dengan budaya tertentu, agama tertentu, politik kekuasaan tertentu dan dan sebagainya. Jadi uh, melihat ars arsip suara siapa yang merekam di direkam untuk apa dengan tujuan apa itu direkam mengapa merekam itu dan sebagainya apa hubungan rekaman itu dengan etnis tertentu yang direkam apa hubungannya dengan kekuasaan bagaimana menggunakan arsip arsip itu untuk berbagai ya, menjelaskan berbagai persoalan uh, yang mungkin sejarah dan juga mungkin persoalan-persoalan kekinian nah, jadi itu sehingga ini juga kemudian uh, memerlukan partner-partner atau teman-teman uh, yang ada uh, terutama di Asia Tenggara yang uh, berminat mengenai bidang-bidang tadi atau ingin memanfaatkan arsip tadi uh, proyek ini memberi kesempatan tiga bulan untuk riset di Belanda atau di Prancis atau di Inggris atau di Jerman untuk mengunjungi tempat-tempat arsip itu di Belanda itu ada dua tempat penting menurut saya untuk uh, arsip suara yang pertama Dilt and Clouds di uh, yang di Amsterdam ya di apa Elversum ya Elversum kemudian ada di uh, tempat Universitas Amsterdam ya terutama koleksinya yang kunci yang sekarang di ada di kantor sebagian di kantornya uh, Barbara kemudian uh, di 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 Berlin ada juga cloud archive ya. Ya di Berlin juga ada dua. Ya. Tentu, tentu saja di Leiden, Universitas Leiden juga ada. Saya juga sudah berbicara dengan mereka di Leiden dan mereka juga sangat senang bisa berpartisipasi ya, ya. di Berlin. Ya. Tapi di Berlin juga ya. Ya ada di apa? Berlin di Universitas Bungo uh, Berlin juga Berlin, ada. Dan juga di Berlin Cloud Archive itu juga. Uh, tentu saja di, di Austria ya, kemudian, ya. kemudian ternyata juga ada rekaman tentang uh, Indonesia di Berlin itu saya beli, kita melihat uh, ini ada Pak uh, Citra Ariandari uh, Dokter Citra Ariandari dari ISI yang juga bersama-sama kita mengunjungi uh, Laut Akhir di Berlin kita mendengarkan bersama-sama mengenai proyek Uh, proyek perekaman suara tapi dilakukan oleh orang Inggris bukan orang, bukan orang. tapi sekarang disimpan di Jerman terhadap para tawanan-tawanan perang tawanan-tawanan uh, perang ini ada yang suruh berbicara ada yang suruh uh, membaca puisi ada juga yang suruh menyanyi bernyanyi dan sebagainya nah segera untuk mencari uh, hubungan antara etnisitas dengan suara untuk dengan bahasa dan dan sebagainya jadi banyak sekali macamnya jadi yang berminat, teman-teman yang berminat untuk uh, melakukan riset-riset mengenai menggunakan 
topiknya bisa apa saja, tapi bahan utamanya adalah uh, sound market. Nah, selama tiga bulan di, di, di Eropa bisa memilih tempatnya, bisa membuat application kepada uh, Dan kami ini bisa membantu dengan aplikasinya. Ya, bagaimana format aplikasinya dan sebagainya bisa uh, bisa di, di, dibantu. Ya, nah itu yang uh, kira-kira ini uh, dilakukan di proyek ini dan uh, kira-kira apa yang bisa kita uh, Uh, yang bisa kita mainkan untuk ikut berprestasi berpartisipasi di dalam mungkin itu kalau ada pertanyaan atau ada diskusi atau ada apa saja yang tidak disampaikan lagi silakan bisa bahasa Indonesia bisa bahasa Inggris ya Mas Odi ada lagi yang tadi pojok ya ya oke okay, Mas Odi dulu terus Mbak Ed Oke, okay, um, selamat almost siang. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Odi, and I'm from the Department of History. Um, uh, uh, in reverse with your situation, I'm not a musicologist. I do not play instrument, but I'm a disabled just call me a historian. <laughs> um, I'm I'm sorry if I'm not mistaken, uh, if I'm mistaken, but uh, you barely or maybe slightly touch upon. Uh, I don't want to dispute the ownership of voice, but mm-hmm. it reminds me, on 2008, there is this movie named uh, Australia, Mel Gibson, Nicole Kidman, and this is a Hollywood movie, but I remember in the first, so before the movie starts, there is a warning that this movie uh, contains the voice of the dead people, people who passed away, yeah. so for uh, aborigines, for the Taurus Islanders and other uh, ethnicities, The first Australians, they call it. Yeah. It's um, they cannot watch this movie because it contains the soft voice of their ancestors. Um, it really uh, intrigues me why, and, and 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 I came to the conclusion that there is this certain, uh, let's say, uh, traditional constraints of listening to this. And I believe uh, to certain to, to certain extent, this project. Um, Um, came into the situations. Uh, let's say we have someone uh, from uh, Nias who joined the project and uh, listened to their ancestors. They would have, like you said, they would have a, a very different feeling as a, but that myself, a Jakartans who don't, my soundscape is very uh, um, making me headache and bustling. But when I listen to the, the, the Music from Nias, of, of course, tells different stories. Uh, how how this project uh, maybe um, address this yeah. issue? Yeah. Okay. Next, okay. 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 Can you mention your name? Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Meta. Uh, um, fifth year PhD students from Cornell University. And I think your um, your theme is really interesting, about decolonizing, and I'm thinking of just to write about that. Um, but I'm working on film, film history during the Japanese occupation, and I'm, I'm wondering if those institutions, these this archival institutions, have um, also film archives or footages, but not only limited to like sounds. Thank you. Terima kasih. Selamat pagi dan menjelang siang. Saya Dirjan mau bertanya, bagaimana cara kita melakukan kritik ekstern dan intern ketika melakukan riset secara musik ini, terutama ketika mendapatkan sumber lisan, tradisi lisan, agar mendapatkan bahan-bahan rekonstruksi yang Otentik dan kredibel. Terima kasih. Okay. You know the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, saya saya mulai dengan pertama, uh, yang pertama ya. Uh, 
this is a very important issue that you're raising, uh, and we are very busy with that within our project. This issue of uh, maybe also what I raised, what different, what the same sound means to different people, right? Mamman menerjemahkan dalam bahasa Indonesia atau cukup cukup jelas untuk semuanya. Ya, masalahnya. Okay, okay. Okay. Then there are very there are various samples in the Abacus collection, for instance, that raise this issue. One one of this of these samples is indeed from Nias. So your your example was was spot on. Uh, where Kunst recorded a recitation that he describes as a recitation uh, to retrieve a dying person from the dead. Now, when I read that, I was I had many questions. Like, I know that Kunst always staged carefully his recordings because there was only this tube that people have to sing into so you can only where is it you can find it here You see that, that you cannot just sort of like with a mobile phone now you just put on play and you and you record something and it and it takes on everything. These machines with these tubes that you have to sing into, you have to stage it carefully. So how a recitation that was uttered to retrieve a dying person from the dead was that just something that just happened to be there by accident or did he stage it? Then we have all kinds of questions, like, can we actually play this at all? Uh, is this so? Is this recitation still the recitation that the priest intended it to be? Uh, does it still have its power? Uh, what would the priest have thought about the fact that this recitation that is meant for this specific goal can now be replayed anywhere in the world? So these are really, really many questions um, and if we want to be a decolonial de project we have to involve also the perspectives of the people who say no you cannot you cannot play this uh, or maybe you should destroy it because it's not supposed to be uh, repeatable um, and I'm not sure what to do with that yet, but, but I think we have to sort of, that is, that is what we want to do with our project, is, is make sure that we hear all the voices that have something to say about this. Which of course is, is practically maybe impossible, but I still think we need to strive for it, because as you say with the example of the Hollywood movie, to, to, to just say, sorry guys, uh, if you have problems with it, just don't watch. Um, that's not how we want to work. So, so how are we going to work then? That's a new way of working, a new way of dealing with this stuff. So thanks for raising that because it's, it's, it's I don't have an answer to it yet, but, but it is, I think that is also one of the goals of this project to make those problems surface and start a dialogue about it, not only among scholars, from the Netherlands and UGM and Jakarta, but also with those who say this is a recitation that should not be heard. So the consequence of that might be that we destroy it. We're certainly not going to put it out on the internet just like this. Yeah. Yeah. Second question about the film. Thank you for that, and I'm really. Saya sangat menang mendengar lebih banyak dalam dalam projek projek ini. 
certainly, as you also saw in the Atkins collection, there are always various uh, media used in one archive or one collection. Uh, and most of the archives that, and the collections that we have, there is certainly also film. But with the Atkins, it's silent film, which is, of course, very interesting, right? That you have silent film about music. So what you see is that the film is often about dance or people playing it and you see the gesticulations of the playing. Um, uh, but there, of course, are also later archives where there is sonic film. And the combination of sound and vision, of course, is very important to get information about a specific practice. So um, also, of course, film scholars are welcome to to join means we certainly don't want to regard sound as something unique and separate from the rest. What we want to do with our project is to make sound part of all the other archival media that we have to view to, to form our stories about the past. Does that answer your question? Part, part, partnership with um, Sound and Vision. Yeah, yeah, we have, they are one of our partners. I didn't put them here because I only put the Southeast Asian partners here, but they are certainly one of our partners. Sound and Vision, built and gebruikt in Wilversum, is one of our partners. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Beeld and Gewaad is a lot of stuff, but we, they are one of our partners, so if people here want to consult the theory of Beeld and Gewaad, that can certainly be done by us. Oh. Yeah. So, um, how to be, how to be critical. Uh, critical and authentic, right? The one who is authentic than critical. Um, yeah, so I, I, I answer in English, if that's okay again. Um, as I said, I feel myself more of a researcher of the methods of Jan Kunst than I feel myself a researcher of, for instance, the Dolly Dolly playing. There are other people who know more about the Dolly Dolly playing than I do, and these people might not be in the university, but we still need them to get an idea about what this Dolly Dolly playing not only is, but also what it means. Like what me singing the, the song, the, the national anthem means. Um, so, I think with the critical approach, uh, I would say that it's an approach in which we mitigate, negotiate various perspectives of people who might have contradictory views on what a song might mean or the recording might mean, because this is also something that I didn't touch upon that much, but which is very important, that what we, he what we hear in Jakob's recording is not neutral. It's only his attempt to record what he heard, and it's also an attempt to make that respond to what he liked most. There are also, um, um, testimonies left over that he said, okay, this should be kept out. Let people, they shouldn't shout in between. Because that's not music for him. Um, but of course, for the people who, who, who saw this, the shout belonged to the, to the song. So, uh, certainly what we hear, the records, they're not authentic in any way. They cannot be. And I don't think that is, that is particularly important as long as we really be very clear about that it is not authentic. But we need to regard it critically by saying what were the circumstances in which this recording happened and who had a, an impact on how it happened. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. Uh, Jadi proyek ini menggunakan sumber-sumber yang sudah memang otentik, karena memang itu pasif-pasif yang memang sudah jelas asal-usulnya. 
sendiri. Kalau melihat dari materinya, itu kita kita menggunakan materi materi yang sudah otentik. Di sini menarik untuk apa yang dikatakan Barbara mengenai decolonizing sebagai metode, ya. sebagai metode, metode untuk mendengar atau menginterpretasikan nasib suara itu sendiri. Ya, secara praktis. We have to be aware since the beginning. Uh, asib ini direkam untuk apa? Untuk kepentingan apa ya asib, uh, suara ini direkam? Uh, bagaimana direkamnya? Uh, siapa yang membiayai perekaman? Untuk tujuan apa? Itu separuh di dikolonisasi di, di Oke, okay. next, we still have a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, masih ada yang pertanyaan silakan. penjajah yang merekam tentang diri kita uh, proses-proses uh, yang terjadi itu apakah ya uh, mungkin saya agak segera uh, apakah uh, hubu, apa relasi-relasi seperti itu tentang siapa yang merekam itu dan siapa yang menyimpannya itu menjadi penting untuk dinegosiasi uh, kaitannya juga dengan repatriasi itu tadi yang kemudian um, saya membayangkan bagaimana pengelolaan arsip di Indonesia itu uh, masih tersebar ter, tentu saja banyak sekali komunitas yang melakukan pengarsipan uh, musik di Indonesia baik itu uh, musik tradisional maupun musik populer uh, kaitan dengan uh, musik populer juga uh, banyak sekali belum lagi kalau misalnya masuk kepada wilayah uh, kesepakatan antar lembaga informasi di Indonesia yang me- masih belum sepakat apakah ini disebut arsip dalam undang-undang di Indonesia misalnya atau ini dikelola sebagai perpustakaan yang semuanya memiliki koleksi masing-masing uh, saya hanya ingin apa namanya me- me- menempatkan beberapa persoalan ini dalam diskusi di pagi ini terima kasih
And so I have, I just uh, want to ask that question, the, the first one, and the second one is related to the air fund questions. Um, I just want to ask, uh, you said that you, you studied or you studying the method of uh, Yakuns, and uh, I just want to ask uh, what your takes or uh, what kind of decolonizing attitude that you learn from those research of the methods of young schools that you can share with us here since uh, you said also decolonizing of attitude or decolonization is kind of buzzword in Europe how we can like delve uh, more into those issue and also uh, yeah coming into another way to uh, yeah, find, finding a new way to learn about this uh, and uh, my bits related to the Irfan ideas about uh, how we dealing with the archive also the last last time I watched a movie called called Anna Regia Venice uh, it's about a girl that becomes a model of a well-known painters for Guggen and uh, basically she, she was sold by her family during uh, yeah, the colonization and I, I get the, the same idea about uh, the honor six since uh, one one way to put it the, the director have this kind of statement uh, to imagine what Anna would say. Uh, so Paul Gugin, uh like depict uh, his uh, her body into a certain kind of way, and uh, she said that it it wasn't me. It's not me, but it was mine. So the the idea of non reference non referential is kind of interesting for me. Can you also? Uh, share your reflection on this idea of son as non-referential kind of things, but in these uh, projects, somehow uh, son still uh, perceived as a referential things. So how we delve uh, into those issues also. Thank you. Ada yang lain atau saya jawab ya dulu. Oke, oke. Pertanyaan Mas Irfan uh, ini tentang pengelolaannya dan, ke, dan kebijakan koleksinya. Uh, jadi pertanyaan juga tentang barisan ini, ini barisan Indonesia atau barisan kelompok atau mungkin barisan Asia Tenggara ya, <laughs> atau barisan dunia. <laughs> uh, saya tidak bisa menjawab <laughs> pertanyaan itu, tapi saya kira pertanyaan sangat penting untuk untuk mendiskusikan uh, sebab itu saya kira ada seorang antropolog uh, menjawab tentang pertanyaan yang sedikit rasist, racist, pertanyaan itu. Who is the Tolstoy of the Zulus? And then, of course, this anthropologist said, Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the Zulus. Because, of course, the Zulu themselves also have, have representatives that cannot be matched by a Tolstoy or by an Edison or by... Uh, so so, so it, that also connects to questions of ownership, of course. It, is this heritage of the world, like UNESCO would like to have it? Or is this a uh, heritage uh, that belongs to a certain group of people? Um, what I would like to say about this is that, and um, what um, knows about it, that we have uh, we have had quite far-reaching contact with the Indonesian government about getting the Akhenaten material back to here and making it part of the National Museum. And in the end, 
but that didn't entirely work out, and therefore with negocies we are actually working much more on grassroots level with very local agents, so and NGOs in Kupan, uh, human rights activists in Papua, uh, uh, artists in the Philippines, uh, and I actually feel more comfortable with that. But it also becomes more complex because you don't say, okay, the Dutch state is required to return this material to the Indonesian state, which I still think is true. It's the Indonesian sovereignty that should be respected. So the Indonesian government is quite right to say, okay, this is the material, it's Indonesian material, bring it back to the border and we decide what happens with it. That could have happened that way, but it didn't. Uh, we all know that. So now I think, now I work with activists from Papua, right? I work with NGOs in, in Kupa. I work with artists in Laos. Um, maybe, maybe that is, for me, a more comfortable way of sharing this material, even though I also feel a bit nakal, a bit naughty, because as a member of the former colonizing power, I should respect the sovereignty of the Indonesian state. Um, so, it's very difficult. But I'm not like to. Then there are the ethical issues that, that, uh, that, that were raised, but there's also the ownership issues. Who, who then is going to decide about what happens with this material? Who, who does it belong to? Um, that's my contribution to the discussion. That that I think I think should be should be helped by, by all of us. Mau melanjut atau saya ke pertanyaan yang lain? Ya. Ya. This this issue of democratization that was actually pointed to me. I was pointed to it by one of my colleagues who wrote the book Noise Uprising. Noise Uprising by Michael Denny. Michael Denny. Thank you. Alice. That was one. It was Alice. Thank you. So, in this publication, he said, you know, it was not only the Gramophone was not only used by colonizers to suppress the colonized. It also enabled lots of people to do the things they wanted to do. And of course, with music, that is very interesting because you hear a sound and you think, ah, oh, wow, this is beautiful. I'm going to do with that, something with that myself as a musician. That was also what Jan Kunst was doing, that he heard melodies and tunes and music and, and rhythms. And he's like, wow, this is so beautiful. I need to preserve this. I need to record it to preserve it. Um, but then, of course, in the sort of capitalist world that we live, in which ownership is important, everyone has to claim ownership over, over his ideas as a scholar, over his song, copyrighted, uh, make discs, make a disc, uh, an album that nobody should copy. It's my own, uh, I need to make a living out of it, I need to get money out of it, so nobody is allowed to, to, to copy it. But how do you do that with music? Because if you change one note in the melody, does it become a different melody, or is it the same melody? Have you stolen the melody from someone else, or have you made a new melody yourself? Uh, and it's all fluid in music. And we call that, in, uh, in musicology, we call that cultural appropriation. Uh, how do I would you translate it? Pendelarasan. Yeah, it is pendelarasan. Apropiasi. Apropiasi, yeah, yeah, apropiasi. Apropiasi. So to make it your own. And there are power issues in that, that some people sometimes with the best intentions abuse this. They hear a melody, they think, oh, I make a nice jazz song out of it. Because that's what jazz is, is, is making your song about the melody that's already there. And then I, I 
I publish an album, and I copyright it, and I make money from an album. There are lots of examples of that. Uh, but it's also how culture works. Culture works by change, by, by hearing something and thinking, I'm making something else of that, or I, make, I, I try to copy it, but in my own way. Um, so, so that is what happened here, that actually a lot of people copied things from one another in very kind of manifold ways, because it was so massive. Um, and these have democratizing potentials because it was not just one person, one sort of European or North American producer who decided what was a beautiful sound and what is not a beautiful sound. But people just heard things and thought, oh, this is what I like about it, which could be very different from what the other person liked about it. And do my thing. So that's what, what in this book Noise Uprising is meant by democratization or decolonization of the ear. It's the ear it? Um, but of course, it depends on, on then how you deal with that as a, as a musician. Um, does that answer your question, first question a little bit? And then your second question about the decolonizing potential of the Afghans, that is also really somewhat contained, very important. Uh, because the Afghans was very progressive in this time. Uh, the musicology up to then was called comparative musicology, and it was carried out by scholars who were mainly based in Europe, who had never been to Indonesia or Africa, but had testimonies from Europeans who went there and came back with transcriptions, because there were no recording. There was no recording in Britain. That was only after ASU in 1877. So they wrote about these musics, but because they had only very limited access to, to what it sounded like, somebody might have brought an instrument or a notation or a description, inevitably they decided that European music was the most advanced of all the music of the world, and all the other peoples were on the lower stages to our sort of one sort of pinnacle civilization. That was very much a sort of 19th century European idea about, about culture. And Kunst was one of the first ones to uh, unsettle this. Because he had this equipment, he went to people to listen and to record it and to play, play back and listen again and listen again and listen again. And think, okay, there are complexities in this that I didn't hear on the first hearing, but that I can now uh, ascertain because I hear it, I get used to the music, I can get the piazza. Um, and therefore, maybe this music is not less complex or more simple than the music that I know from Europe. Uh, so that was a new starting point and a very sort of empowering, emancipating uh, standpoint. And Kurtz also had big discussions with European music critics who kept arguing for the superiority of European culture and European music. And he had really good arguments to counter these, these assumptions. And, and he uncovered the ignorance of those uh, assumptions. So in that sense, there's lots of the decolonial potential in Kunst's thinking. What is problematic from a current standpoint is that the Kunst also coined the concept of ethnos, of, of a group of people that is uh, categorized by means of their outer features. Of course, it was also standing practice then, but he has still uh, very sort of specific ideas that people of a certain ethnos make certain music or are able to understand or appreciate certain music. And he, he also made the link between people's musical abilities and preferences and their outer features, which, is, which, we, which we would now call racist or racialist. And he really kept insisting on those intrinsic differences between different ethnoses that have different practices. And the boundaries between them should not be uh, crossed. So 
not only should people from Indonesia not use popular music influences, he, he really disliked Kanjong, for instance, because he, he saw that there were, there were so many different influences. He also found, uh, argued that, that, that European people should not play Gamma because that's for the Indonesians. So he didn't want to cross those borders. He had very sort of strict ideas, static ideas about ethnos. So these two aspects are there, this thought from a current perspective, that are both decolonial and very colonial. Tapi Juni memutuskan untuk 
Ya. Semua bisa 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 atau tidak bisa masuk ke Eropa. Best preference. Good response. Yeah, response. Yeah, question. Thank you. And the comments, which is a very important comment. Thank you very much. Um, so, with regards to my experience of what I encounter was being left out, right? Um, what we are mostly busy with now is the issue of metadata. How are the sources described? So these can be sound sources, but also the photos that you saw, um, the film that you saw, the correspondence that you saw. Um, if we want to make that correspondence searchable, for instance, what are the search terms that are important in the the search terms that are less important. Uh, that's difficult for us to decide. I think it's more appropriate to decide for those who actually know what the correspondence is about with regard to a certain music practice or a certain dance practice or a cultural, certain social, social habit or uh, event. Um, sometimes we hear that people have problems uh, finding material because it's labeled not necessarily wrongly, but in a way that is not fitting with current times anymore. So then I mean, for instance, the reference to ethnos, that you can find it on a specific ethnos that might not make sense now, or a specific style that is regarded very broadly or, or very uh, the patas very 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 in a very small way. Um, so um, we think that if people from more different backgrounds can uh, decide about how to categorize this material, how to make it searchable, how to label it, uh, then it might become more accessible to more people. But then we come to your second comment, which is very important. Who, who are these representatives? And, and are they sort of tokens to have the sort of required quotum of, uh, uh, of, of people of color, or people, people from, from diverse backgrounds? Um, Thanks for bringing that up because it's 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 one of the tensions of the project, and I think of many decolonization projects. Of course, we want to make the discourse inclusive, but but then again, how do you make it inclusive, and and don't you sort of fall into into tokenisms if you start building your own network? So what we actually intend to do is not only send representatives to Europe, that is what the visiting fellows might revolve into, but that's certainly also a way to just give young career scholars or, or artists or activists an extra support to, to start their research project. What we really want to do is set up and some of these Networks have already been set up, a network, an inter-Asian network of knowledge exchange. So what we feel, for instance, is that, is that Indonesian scholars often know more about scholarship in the Netherlands than they know about scholarship in, the, in Vietnam, and that scholars from Laos know more about France than they know about the Philippines, and that Philippine scholars know more about America, the United States, than they know about I don't know, Taiwan. Uh, 
so the, 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 the lines of knowledge are still going through these former colonial powers and the nation states also. Um, and what happens if we if we break that, if, if we reconsider that and, and make sure that we have a network of people who know how to find each other directly. And that's already happening. I, I know there's some Chitra Iron Diamonds with CMAX and, and, and there is the uh, Lao Lao Network, which is an Asian network of music archivists um, that exists and that we also want to revive. So there, there are existing structures. But if we can uh, strengthen those existing structures, we can also maybe contribute to changing flows of knowledge. So flows of knowledge yeah, often go from north to south and European, European people telling these people how to carry out scholarship, what to do. And I, I found that from UPCE we learned a lot back. So the knowledge, knowledge flow went in the other direction. But then what would be best maybe is the south to south, like Ucarno <coughs> already tried with the Af Afro-Asian uh, conference in 1955, uh, that, that the global, that there's, that there's sort of a, a, a network of the global south. But of course, this is not up to me. Zijn daar niet belangrijk? Was hij? So, so we need to do that in 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 in, in discussion with everyone. <laughs> but yeah, it's attention. It's attention. This. Inclusivity, and what does it mean, this inclusivity? So thanks for bringing that up, because it's not a finished business. Yeah, thank you. Um, kita sudah mendekati jam 12, jadi uh, saya kira kita harus segera mengakhiri diskusi ini. Uh, di mana-mana di Eropa, hubungan antara bekas jajahan dan yang menjajah itu sedang menjadi topik yang hangat jadi ya, tema dekolonisasi atau dekolonizing uh, archive and heritage and things like that menjadi populer di uh, di mana mana dibicarakan di mana mana uh, banyak yang berpendapat bahwa objek objek atau benda benda yang ada di sana yang milik orang orang Asia Tenggara milik bangsa bangsa yang dijajah itu uh, harus dikembalikan repatriasi itu bagian dari decolonizing thing. Tapi ada juga yang berpendapat bahwa uh, tidak penting siapa yang menyimpan, tidak penting di mana itu berada, tapi bagaimana kita uh, memanfaatkan, menggunakan untuk bisa dimanfaatkan bersama-sama oleh kedua bangsa sebagai bagian dari sejarah hubungan antar kedua bangsa itu sendiri. Saya sendiri saya merasa lebih sependapat dengan pendapat yang kedua ini sebetulnya uh, walaupun question of origin question of originality question of identity itu uh, sangat penting untuk uh, di alam atau untuk di apa, digali melalui data-data seperti ini sehingga banyak sekali prominent research perlu dilakukan riset-riset seperti ini perlu dilakukan uh, Tidak hanya mungkin yang lebih banyak berkepentingan sebetulnya pelaku-pelaku apa pelaku-pelaku atau komunitas daripada negara itu sendiri sebetulnya. Misalnya orang-orang ahli musik itu melihat seperti ini menjadi sangat sesuatu yang sangat uh, penting gitu. Uh, ketika kita tanya tentang uh, origin, originality, identity, identity seperti itu. Di museum nasional itu banyak sekali alat musik nasional Nusantara yang dikumpulkan oleh Yapus Kemudian sebagian alat musik itu disimpan di museum nasional sekarang Yang kita tidak pernah tahu bunyinya kayak apa Bentuknya aneh-aneh sekali seperti yang ada di ya, depannya ya, itu musik ya, ya, Itu alat musik ya. Bunyinya seperti apa kita nggak pernah dengar Kita nggak pernah dengar Dan Inilah salah satu relasi antara objek-objek ini dengan asip suara. Ya. Jadi bagaimana kita bisa kemudian oh suaranya seperti itu ternyata. 
Dan dari hubungan antara objek dengan suara menjadi sangat penting. Jadi hanya musik itu sendiri, tapi bisa objek-objek yang lain. Kan? Bayangkan alat merekam di masa lalu tidak sederhana sekarang seperti HP bisa di selipkan di baju, di kantong bisa merekam dengan suara yang jernih sementara di masa lalu alatnya begitu gede membawanya pun berat kemana-mana harus ditempatkan di pelosok-pelosok nias yang sangat sulit ditempuh dalam perjalanan semua suara tentu masuk dan sulit sekali untuk bisa mendengarkan origin tapi paling tidak kita menjadi bisa mengenalinya kemudian dan bisa menghubungkan dengan berbagai objek space, ruang, waktu, puasa, dan sebagainya Nah itulah penting dari proyek ini uh, penting dari uh, artinya PR, homework yang kita punya terutama bagi akademisi yang ingin melakukan penelitian-penelitian ilmiah akademis mengenai topik decolonizing sounds art itu apalagi selama ini uh, asib yang berupa suara ini masih sangat di, apa ya, dikesampingkan daripada asip-asip yang lain suara masih e, masih dikesampingkan di dalam e, digunakan dalam penelitian-penelitian akademik nah ini kesempatan dan juga tadi itu banyak sekali e, aspek metodologi yang dipertanyakan dari Mas Odi mengenai bagaimana itu kita ber, berurusan dengan suara-suara yang sebetulnya itu restrain gitu ya Kemudian bagaimana uh, merelate suara-suara itu dengan kekinian kita, dengan public policy dan sebagainya. Bagaimana kemudian uh, faktor kepemilikan properti uh, repatriasi banyak sekali yang perlu diadres di dalam topik uh, riset seperti ini dan itu bisa menjadi uh, PR untuk diperdalam nanti siapa yang tertarik untuk apply untuk melakukan riset pertanyaan-pertanyaan seperti ini bisa diajukan untuk ditulis dalam uh, lamaran aplikasi untuk riset di sana. Saya kira itu terima kasih uh, Barbara sudah menyimpan semua itu. Tadi sela-sela kebetulan diskusi yang sangat menarik ya. Selamat jalan ke Flores bisa ya, ke, ya, ke timur ya. Ke timur. Ke timur. Semoga perjalanan lancar dan terima kasih kembali selamat datang. Bisa datang lagi nanti. Semoga, semoga terima kasih semuanya yang sudah hadir di sini. Terima kasih uh, sudah berpartisipasi dalam diskusi ini. Maaf jika saya ada kekurangan di dalam mengangkat diskusi. Uh, selamat siang, assalamualaikum.